road to greatness is never walked alone. In fact, greatness is never achieved in a vacuum. It's forged in community. Today, I'll share with you how to spot the kind of relationships that produce greatness in those you touch and how to find mentors that bring out the very best in you. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay with me. Thanks for joining us for this December 23rd edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I'm Katie Kennard. Now, there's no question that the people around us have an impact on our lives, but Chip takes it a step further and explains why pursuing great people helps us become all God wants us to be and how to begin finding those special people today. Now, here's Chip with more. Who are the people in your Mount Rushmore? Mine was a coach, another my sister, another Dave, and the fourth over here is Howard Hendricks. And you've heard lots of stories, but I, I learned from Howard Hendricks that you could take your gift and you could dream a dream and you could have clear, I still remember on the board him writing objectives, priorities, schedule, discipline. God will never love you more than he loves you right now, gentlemen. He said, but his blessing, his blessing is dependent upon your obedience. You can never earn his favor. There's no brownie points, no gold stars on the refrigerators in heaven. But every man needs to make up his mind, what do you want to do with your life? So you need to have an objective and a target. You want to be a man of God? Determine, I want to be a man of God. And if you want to be a man of God, it has to be a priority. More important than anything or anyone else. And then you have to put that in your schedule and say, what does it look like? When will you get up? What will you read? What will you do? And then you got to discipline yourself to do it, not to earn anybody's favor but God's. Those four things. You know, Prof taught me that you're given gifts and life's of stewardship. And God really does want to bless ordinary people. Who's on your Mount Rushmore mentally right now? Who are those people? Because it's going to tell you where the needs surface. It's going to tell you what antennas, because those needs that those people met are going to be the needs also probably in the future. Well, I'm going to give you my last one. Right in the center where everyone else looks is the person who has impacted my life more than Howard Hendricks or Punky or Dave Marshall or Coach. And that is um, my wife. Uh, my wife has had more impact on my life than anyone else because she has more integrity. I live up close. She has more integrity than anyone I know. Uh, she has more devotion to God, evidenced by watching her get up for years and get up in the wee hours of the morning, even when we had small kids. And I've seen her on her knees and I heard her cry out for God. And I've watched her pray and I've watched her support me. Uh, she is more mentally tough than any player in any game on any team I've ever played on. And it's something I admire. There just ain't no give up in Teresa. And those of you that know her story, uh, she was a single mom for a while. And she had a tiny little boy on each hip and no way to support herself and trying to figure out what to do. And she clung to God and came to Christ and God supplied. And I'll tell you what, we've been through some really, we've been through times digging quarters out of the back seat. You know, just not, you know, five, six, seven, eight dollars in a co-op and taking the fruit and vegetables to live on. And you know what? No, com I've never heard her complain about our lifestyle. I've never, ever heard cry. You know, and so far, every time we move, she knows for sure it's God's will, and she knows she doesn't want to do it. I mean, it's just a pattern. <laughs> Don't take me out to that little place. And she cried in the Chinese restaurant. And then when we went from Kaufman to, to all the way out to California, she and all the kids cried all the way to Amarillo. And then when it was California back to Atlanta, she cried. And you know what? There's a lot of women who say, you know, honey, if you want to go, you just go ahead. You know, my family's here. Things are here. My wife submits to God and does what he wants her to when it feels good and when it's terribly painful. And when you live up next to that kind of loyalty and courage and integrity and devotion, I'll tell you what, I mean, that exaggerating in messages, you can only do that so long with someone after each time you do it. Say, Chip, why did you lie to those people today? I mean, she looks really like sweet and everything. <laughs> and she is. But she's a very, very tough sweet. And um, she's changed my life more than anyone else. She's filled the gaps and the wounds and the deficits more than anybody else. If you want to pursue great people, start first 
with your rear view mirror. And I would encourage you as just a little discipline. You can change the faces, you know. It's okay. But go through and jot down the four or five people that have most impacted your life. And you will begin to see exactly who God has used and likely the roles that he'll want to use in the future. Uh, Next, I encourage you to um, look out of the windshield of your life. And out of the windshield, we all need three kinds of people. And since Howard Hendricks was my mentor, I want to give credit here. This isn't from me. This is from him. But see, I caught it more than it was taught. And Prof. Hendricks would tell you and tell me we all need three kinds of people. Number one, we all need a Paul in our life. We need someone to learn from. Second, we all need a Barnabas, a friend, a peer, someone to share life with, someone that you're just hand in hand, arm in arm. You know, you're on the same page at the same level. And third, we all need a Timothy. We need someone that we're helping grow. A Barnabas, someone you share life with. A Timothy, someone that you give life to. And a Paul, someone who helps you. So let me ask you. You got a Paul in your life? You have a person in your life that um, is kind of a go-to person that Uh, helps you grow, that you know they're a few miles down the road spiritually than you and you you can talk to them and ask them and pray with them? Do you have a Barnabas? Do you have a soulmate? Do you you have someone that you can just, you know, you're in this life together. You can pick up the phone and instantly you're on the same page. And then do you have a Timothy? Do you have someone that you are building into their life and praying by God's grace that what Dave did in my life and what Prof did in my life, they'll be in yours. I'll give you three quick examples because it's very rare to have ones that are in your life for a long period of time, right? We move, a lot of things happen. What I find is that Paul may be this person this year, another person two years from now, another person, and the different roles for different seasons of your life. And you know what, you might, but now and then, You get a Paul that sticks around and a Barnabas that sticks around and a Timothy that sticks around that I think is both rare and precious. But I went to a little country church and man, I I needed a father figure. And there's a guy on the elder board there named AC. And he just took me under his wing. And we worked out together and I shared struggles with him. My older boys were like third grade then. He's counseled, rebuked, invested painted bathrooms in the house with me and just done life. I mean, you know, when I was coming out here, you know, I'm I'm going through issues like you're going through issues and he's got issues in my life. You know, I came out a day early and I came out a day early so we could meet with one other guy, but I wanted just to get with AC so there's one man I could unzip my heart and say, hey man, here's the hot ones in me. How are they going in your life? And, you know, we, we, we took some walks, we ate some meals, we got a couple workouts, and then we just kind of data dumped, heart dumped. I need that. i got to have a Paul in my life. I don't think you ever outgrow it. And then we were eating lunch, and, you know, this is what Pauls do because they have the freedom. He had this little, he had this little uh, card. I couldn't read it. It was real small, and we'd been eating and talking, and, you know, we're really close. And he pulls out this little white card, and he has this goofy, he does a lot of goofy stuff, to tell you the truth. But... Uh, he had this kind of goofy look, and he said, uh, and I could tell he's reading off this card. Have you viewed any sexually explicit material in the recent past? <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, what happened to pass the hamburger or something? And you know what I knew? What I knew was he was dead serious. I said, no. He said, have you in any way misused your finances or used them in a way that wouldn't honor God in the past 60, 30, 90 days? And I mean, he went through my thought life, my sex life, my integrity. And then the last question after he went through this list, he smiled. He said, have you lied to me in your answers of any of the last five or six questions? You got a Paul? You know how much that protects you? So you got to pursue great people. You've got to go after them. You also need a, uh, a Barnabas. I had a fellow that uh, we just linked hearts, first basketball trip out, a guy named Glenn Miller. And Glenn was a man of devotion and heart and love. And he went off later to be a missionary in Sri Lanka, later became a pastor. And, and for 
20 years, Glenn and I have stayed in touch, and he's just been a peer. He's a little bit older than me. He's like that little bit older big brother, but I was a little farther ahead early spiritually. And so the first trip we went on, we memorized the book of Philippians together. The next trip we went on, we memorized the book of James together. This guy's got zeal that is over the top. He leaves me voice messages in Tagalog. See Jesus on the an sakalani tan dumutwai. Hey Ingram, how you doing, buddy? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? Hey, hey, isn't it sweet? He's just he talks about God like he's just in the room, and he's just I mean he's just winsome Barnabas. And what what I know and what he knows is, no matter where we're at in the world or the country, it's just we're peers. And he's got a dream where he's building orphanages now in Africa, along with pastor in the church. And um, someone who's just running kind of at the same place in the track with you that you can bounce stuff off of. Third area is a Timothy, someone you get to invest in. And there was a guy who was a football coach in that little town. And uh, AC had me and him meet together and we'd review and memorize these verses. See, see you, do, you do life together. The thinking great thoughts and, you know, reading great books. I don't know about you. I'm not disciplined to do that. But you find a couple guys or you find a couple gals and you say, well, let's do it on this morning at this time. And we went to the feed store. And we'd eat a little breakfast and we'd all go over our verses and memorize a couple verses. And, and little by little by little by little, you grow. And pretty soon he's a football coach, defensive back. His name was Steve. And Steve came on staff at that little church, and it started to grow. And then I went to California, and he came, did the college group, and then he did the small groups, and then he did this, and then he ran the staff. And then he hit 45, and I'll never forget the day, because we, we worked together for 18 years. I got way more credit. I could kind of dream it, and he could make it happen. And um, he hit 45, and I hit it about a year or two before him. And he said, you know something? You know that agreement we had? We, we're going to work together as long as we live until God brings us to a point where we think we do more good for the kingdom apart. And since we're both a couple old coaches, he said, hey, dude, I think that the, the run has ended. And I said, I think you're right. And we were, we were learning some things and leadership together. And he said, you know, I've done every job in this church and there's only one I really want to do. And you're not retiring, are you? I said, no, I'm not. He said, then I got to do what you're doing. I got to be a senior pastor. Guess what he's doing? You know what he's doing? He's doing what I got to teach him and what I got to learn from Prof. See, you pursue great people. And now you get on the phone, and sometimes those Timothys just turn into Barnabases. And I learn more from Steve than I'm sure he's ever learned from me. Pursue great people. And you know, you'll never have time in your schedule to do it. Busyness is the curse of our day. And I struggle with it as much as you. You will have to come up with a specific plan. But you got to look out the windshield and ask yourself, who out there could be a Paul in my life right now? Who out there could be a Barnabas that I could share life? Who could be a Timothy that, and you know what? You only have to be a half a step ahead of someone to teach him what you know. You don't have to have it all together. Final thing I'd like to share here is um, uh, get you started without getting you discouraged. And so I want to give a warning to heed. A warning to heed. And the warning is this, for Timothy's looking for Paul's. Um, often, God will use a variety of people. Don't believe there's some person that will have it all together that's going to be this person that is going to sustain and help you grow for the rest of your life. It'll be more like a revolving door of different people, different seasons to meet different needs as you grow. Now, sometimes you get that special person that, you know, that you stay in touch with them. I think that's more rare than it is normal. So, so when you're looking for that, Paul, don't get your expectations like they're going to meet with you every week and it's going to be this way or that way. Secondly, a warning for Paul's looking for Timothy's. Um, you can't get where all you do is give. Some of you are in a season of your life where you're giving to people, you're giving to people, you're giving to people, and, and, but there's no one giving into you. And you, find, you don't, can't figure out why you're losing the joy and you're tired. Because you know what? You, got all, uh, you need some VEP people in your life, very encouraging people. When you're a Paul, when people are looking to you and you've hit a time of maturity and you're helping this guy over here in a Bible study with these women over here and then you're teaching over here and you're trying to raise this, you can give, give, give. And Paul's what happened? 
is a lot of people really get burned out because no one's given to them. You don't give yourself permission to get renewed. You don't give yourself permission to have fun. You don't give yourself permission to let someone build into your life or have a few relationships. This is hard for some of you guys and some of you driven women. Have some relationships where you don't have to get anything done. You just get to hang out. I mean, tonight at supper, I got to eat with a, a couple real buddies. I mean, guys that, you know, I go way back with. And part of it, I mean, they've so built in my life. But one of the great things about them, we just hang. I mean, we laugh. I mean, we play golf. We play tennis. We, I mean, we just cut up. We share our hearts. But just having some people in your life that, I mean, when I'm around them, I don't have to be anybody but chip. I mean, I don't have to be a pastor. I mean, I don't have to perform. I don't, I'm not worried about that. They just love me. They just love me. And they like to be with me, and I like to be with them. And if you're a Paul, you've got to have some of that in your life. And if you don't, you'll find yourself hurting. Let me give you now a word of perspective to consider. Is that I think what happens is we get these categories, and I'm going to suggest that you know, every category of Paul's and Barnabas's and Timothy's is God often will give role players in your life. And, and I've put a few of them here. And I'll give you a couple highlights. And, you know, they may be a Paul, but their role as a Paul is a father figure. That was AC for me. Huge, huge impact in my life. Uh, but then some people, God gives you a, a cheerleader. Uh, someone who uh, just cares and it gets excited for you. And I, I was a young guy in this church. And the little church was growing. It became a medium-sized church. And I had this dream in my heart. And I thought I, I couldn't even say it out loud. I wanted to be the pastor of a large church. Doesn't that sound arrogant? Doesn't that sound terrible? Doesn't that sound like you're trying to make a big something of yourself? But I just had this desire. I, I just saw how they worked and I wanted that kind of impact. And I remember saying out loud to Don Geiger, Don, I, I just feel so bad and so terrible because I've got this desire. And he says, well, why do you feel bad? Well, isn't that ambitious and isn't it wrong? He said, well, why do you want to be the pastor? Is it so you can be a big someone? Well, I said, no. I said, I just think that's where I would really flourish. He said, Chip, I get people calling all the time. He was a pastor of a large church. He said, they're really hard to find. It's a unique gift mix, and you have that gift mix. It's God calling you to do that. He was my cheerleader. He just said, go for it, man. And you know what? Within a year and a half, Santa Cruz called. And, but I couldn't have gone there if that cheerleader wasn't in my life. Sometimes God will bring a prophet in your life. I, a guy named Bill Lawrence my wife and I sat in a little room and he evaluated my preaching and he looked me right in the eye and he said, Chip, you've got some real gift. You've got some real gift in communicating. And I'm thinking, thank you. He said, but I can't figure out something. I said, what's that? He said, I can't figure out whether you're just downright lazy or you don't believe in preaching. I mean, a real man would never do that in front of your wife. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, I just can't figure out. He said, um, I, I can see how your mind works. Oh, you do a good job with the text. The last 10%, you're just lazy. You're, you're shooting shotguns. You don't shoot bullets. Tell you what, you need to put another five, six, seven hours in on that last part of the sermon. It needs to be clear. It needs to be concise. It needs to be focused. You need to shoot a bullet, a Teflon bullet that bang, goes through and God uses. And he's given you a gift to do that. You're shooting shotguns, little BBs doesn't take you much time to prepare. You like to study, but you're not doing the hard part at the end. Now, is it because you're just lazy or you don't believe in the power of preaching? And man, I'll tell you what, he, he rocked my world. And you know, I looked over to the sweet, lovely Teresa looking for compassion, like, tell me it's not so, honey. <laughs> and she looked at me and goes, he doesn't believe in preaching. He's not lazy, but he doesn't believe. He, all he does is wants to do these discipleship groups, discipleship groups, and he just gets, gets them. He doesn't believe in preaching. And a man, I'll tell you what, I decided that I, before God, would, I, I wrote on a card, my goal is to preach great messages for God. Does that sound arrogant? What do you think, God wants okay ones? Bad ones? So-so ones? And I decided whatever it would take for me to learn to preach great. And then I listened to people preach. I went to people who preached. I listened to tapes. I read books. I, and then I did that last seven to ten hours to get it from a shotgun to a bullet. Got any prophets in your life? People that aren't worried about offending you? See, there'll be Paul's at times, Timothy's at times. But they're role players. How about a sponsor? 
You ever been in a situation where you needed someone to lift you up and, and move you to a place that you could never get there on your own? I was in a uh, little breakfast nook and a guy had come by the church and said, hey, you know, we got a wonderful plan for your life and we think you'd be really good on radio and uh, we couldn't use you on our station, but you really ought to consider it. And I was eating breakfast with a guy named Dick. And, uh, and I was, man, we're doing five services, video overflow with five services. I thought that's the dumbest thing in the whole radio. Who listens to radio? I think, you know what, isn't that crazy? I can't believe that because he was a mentor in my life. And, you know, we'd play golf about every Thursday or every other Thursday. And I'd bounce my sermon off him. And I'd, I'd ask him all my leadership questions. And he, he, he always was helping me grow personally and learn how to lead. And I'd ask him all kind of questions and just glean and I remember him sitting across. He said, I'm going to call you tonight. I said, okay. And then towards the end, he said, uh, I don't need to call you. I said, okay. You need to do the radio thing. I said, what? You need to do it. I mean, this is not, this is a sponsor. This isn't like, it'd be a good idea. Why don't you pray about it? Uh, God has shown me. It's, you need to do it. I said, well, I don't know anything about radio. I don't know how much it costs. I don't know. He said, it doesn't matter. I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? We'll have to do. He said, just do it. I said, well, well, how? He said, well, I'll pay for the first year. I said, well, how much will it cost? He says, I don't know. He said, but whatever it is, I'll just pay for it. God's in this. God used him to launch. I didn't want to do it. See, God will bring people into your life that will sponsor you. But guess what? You got to pursue and get around people. Find great people who pray. Find people with great marriages. Find great leaders. Find people that are raising good kids. Find people that are doing the kind of things that you want to become like and figure out a way to get next to them. Pursue great people. And God will bring sponsors and cheerleaders and, you know, a, a counselor, a hero. Joe Stoll, I, you know, I wasn't kidding. He's one of my heroes. I think you always want to have someone to say, that, like, is in your line of work. I want to be like him. I want to be like him. So I listen to Joe. When I have a big decision, I call Joe. A hero. I think God wants a counselor in our lives, someone that you can open up your heart and share. It's a guy named Dick Meyer. He was a counselor counselor. And you know, you know those wounds and those things we talked about? Sometimes you've got to pursue a great person. You've got to pay them. <laughs> because there's stuff you don't know how to figure out. And you've got friends and they're counselors. And you just say, hey, I, I, need, I don't know. How, my ball is lost in the weeds, as Prof would say. But I don't know how to get it untangled. And they sit down with you and they, and they share insight and life and truth. And Which of those in that list do you need in your life? Which specific role player? What, what do you need? What kind of person? What, even as I'm speaking, what kind of names or faces are coming to your mind that aren't on your old Mount Rushmore, but if you were going to build a new Mount Rushmore, who could go on there to say, I think this person could have a positive impact in my life. I want to be more like him. I want to be more like her. Have you got it? Then let me give you an action plan to go on. Number one, an action plan to follow. I gave you a perspective to consider, role players, and now an action plan to follow. Number one, pray earnestly. And we just learned what earnestly meant, right? I mean, I don't think these people are hanging on trees, and I'll guarantee you, their, their schedule is full. And so you pray earnestly, Lord, show me. Number two, take initiative. I just, I've just, over the years, I just have an antenna. Well, as soon as I got to Atlanta, I thought, who, Lord? Who, I got to find some guys that are walking with God. I got to find some guys that really love you. I got to find someone that, you know, is, is farther down the road in me. And I just started looking for, I know I need a cheerleader. I need a confidant. I need a sponsor. I need role players. I don't know if they're going to be my Paul. And I'm still going to call on the phone and actually arrange my schedule. But I've got to find people who are going to be a Paul in my life. And then I got to find some Barnabases. And then I got to ask myself, okay, it's a new world. It's a new day. Is there some people that you want me to invest my life in? But you take initiative. And three, start in your relational network. The Paul, Timothys, and Barnabases are probably already in your relational network. Start there. Four is ask for help. This is amazing. It's, it's sometimes we don't... I uh, was just in Florida and uh, had a chance to meet with uh, some people who had been very kind and generous to the ministry. And there was a guy there that had been a mentor with a leader that I really respect. He's a Christian leader who I think maybe um, just in terms of sheer leadership gift, 
um, maybe the finest that I know. I mean, I have, I've read and listened. And, and this guy, I found out as we played nine holes of golf, had mentored this guy, and he talked to me about it. And I just, I just couldn't resist. I thought, you know, I don't know, I don't know what role he's going to play in my life, but you know what? If he mentored that guy, he's pretty good. So, uh, you know, I played golf. We had a dinner, and then I taught a Bible study. And, and I just, you know what? You have not because you asked not. And I walked over to this guy said, excuse me, John, can I get a word with you before I go? Got to catch a plane? Yeah. John, um, you know what you did for that guy? Yeah. Would you help me? This organization is growing so rapidly. I'm over my head, and he's in a way, way bigger organization that's way, way more complex. Would you help me the way you helped? If I called you, would you give me time on the phone? And if I asked you questions, would you help me? He said, I'd be glad to. And I said, great. Well, I don't have any contact. And you know what? Someone else was talking, and this guy walks back to me, and he goes, here. Here's my personal card, and here's my other card. And he said, just give me a call any time. See, the kind of people that want God to use their life, they're looking for eager Timothys who want to grow and want to learn. Pursue great people. Pray earnestly, take initiative, start with your relational network, ask for help. (laughs) Here's the one, persevere. They often say no 10 times before they say yes. I could tell you my Prof. Hendrick story. You don't want to hear it. I don't want to tell it. It took me three years. Persevere, persevere, persevere. Or do it by proxy. A lot of people that have mentored me, I just, I can't get close to them, but they got books. I've listened to them. I find someone close to them. I ask them questions. I've, when, as the church was growing, I went around to every major place in America where things were growing, and I tried to get near the guy who did it, and if I couldn't, I got next to the guy who was next to him. If I couldn't, then I'd get, you know what? I'm going to get as close as I can, or I'm going to read what they wrote, or I'm going to listen to it, because there's a lot of different ways to keep growing. And finally, make time in your schedule. You'll never have it. No one's going to call you on the phone and say, would you like to be mentored? Would you like to really grow? Would you like to put in some time and be very disciplined and very focused for the next five to seven years that will totally transform your life and probably the life of your entire relational network and possibly could change the world in a radical way? No one is going to call you and say that. But you know what you can do? You can pursue great people. And you can look for your Paul. And you can look for a soulmate Barnabas. And then all the while, you find someone that you have a little bit more than they have, and you start giving it away, and I'm telling you, you'll become great in God's eyes. Chip will be back in a minute with some additional thoughts from today's talk, so stay with us. Now, Chip created this series, Good to Great in God's Eyes, to help Christians grow in ways that God thinks are important. So the idea of becoming great rather than a prideful thing, becomes a personal passion to please the heart of God. To learn more, just tap special offers. Chip, you believe that God has challenged you in the ministry to really help people plug into serving, to apply their God-given gifts. Would you take a few minutes and tell us more about this? I'd love to, Katie. In fact, one of the things I know is that for a person to live like a Christian, there are three things that have to happen by the grace of God. You have to come before God and really get to know him personally. Uh, Second, you have to do life in community. And third, you have to be on mission. Every single one of us was made by God with a special, unique purpose. And and what we know is that 80% of followers, whether you're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80, followers of Jesus, 80% of them, they want to be used by God. But there's this huge disconnect where and how and, you know, what are my gifts and What we did in our research over the last three years is we found the great majority, I mean, 80% plus, were serving, but when they served, it was like, this really isn't doing it for me. I'm doing it out of obligation. It's not meaningful. Uh, It's not something where I feel like I'm really being greatly used by God. You know, I'm just sort of being a willing servant, and that's a good first step. And we have developed a tool that will allow people in a very short amount of time to discover their spiritual gift, their leadership style, some specific things about way they think and how God made them so they can find where and how he wants to use them the most. Can you imagine unleashing an army, mobilizing a group of people that are on the sidelines, young people, middle-aged people, older people who would go from you know what, I really want to be used by God to, I'm so frustrated, I don't do it anymore, 
to I wake up every day like, oh, God, I can't believe I get to do this. That's what's coming. We're rolling it out in 2020 at Living on the Edge. I can't wait to share more. The project Chip just described is called Serve First. See, the mission of Living on the Edge is to help Christians live like Christians. And this is just one more way we're pursuing that mission. If you'd like to get in on helping fellow believers really use their spiritual gifts, now would be a great time to become a financial partner. Because thanks to a small group of friends of the ministry, every gift we receive between now and December 31st will be doubled. So to make a donation, just tap special offers. Now, Chip, you talked today about everyone needing a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy in our lives. How do we begin to develop those kinds of relationships when, honestly, a lot of us already feel like we're overloaded? Well, first is you got to really be committed to uh, want those relationships, because if you want to be different, then you got to hang with some people that are going to really influence you in areas where you need it. Uh And so I tell people, start with your Paul. And and if you're not growing, guess what? You don't have much to share with your Barnabas, and you don't have much to share with the Timothy. And for many of you, the Timothys in your life are like called your kids, all right? And, And the Barnabas is your wife or your husband. And so I encourage people to say, okay, admission. What do I need? Um, Who is godly? Who has a quality of life that when I see and watch their life, and it might be their walk with God, it might be how they live out their singleness, it might be their maturity, it might be their parenting skills. Number two, I would either call them on the phone, invite them for coffee. You want to tell them that you've been praying. And by the way, you have to pray to tell them you've been praying, okay? And you're going to ask for specific help in one area. So you're going to say, as I've prayed and observed your life, Hypothetically, I see a quality of your walk with God in your marriage that I'd like in my life. Would you be willing to meet with me one hour per month where I could come and ask you questions about your walk with Christ and how that plays out in your marriage? Would you be willing to do that for five months in a row? That's how you start. Just before we close, I want to say thank you to those who make this program possible through your generous financial support. Now, if you found today's program helpful but have never supported us financially, there's never been a better time than right now. Because when you give a gift to Living on the Edge, it's going to be matched dollar for dollar thanks to some very generous friends of the ministry. Now, making a donation is easy. Just tap the Donate button here on the app. Well, on behalf of Chip and the whole team, this is Katie Kennard saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. 